Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm Irene Sun Wu, the John H. Bryan Chair of Architecture and Design here at the museum. And before we begin, I just kindly ask that you please silence your mobile devices. So I want to thank you all for joining us for today's event with our esteemed speakers, architects Emmanuel Admasu and Jen Wood, who are principals of ADWO, a New York-based architecture and art practice. And they'll be in conversation with Dawit L. Petros, an artist, educator, and researcher based between Chicago and Montreal, and an associate professor of photography here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The museum is pleased to present this program in partnership with the Chicago Architecture Biennial, uh, which recently opened its fifth edition under the artistic direction of the Floating Museum. And the biennial features a stellar installation by Adwo titled 100 Links. Uh, so I can encourage you to go down the street to the Chicago Cultural Center to see it. It's really, truly a standout project at this year's biennial. So I'm so thrilled to have such astute and inspiring speakers lead today's conversation, which broadly speaking, will reflect on how the entanglement of colonialism and migration connects Africa, Europe, and North America, and demands new forms of spatial imagination. And with that, I would also argue that the work of both Adwo and Dawit um, illuminates the need for new representational tools and methodologies to uncover and interrogate gaps and blind spots in the existing historiography of global modernisms. And in their work and in their thinking, we encounter expanded notions of cartography and archives, critical experiment across media and institutional platforms, as well as beautifully productive convergences of architectural and artistic practices. So I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Founded in 2015 by Jen Wood and Emmanuel Admasu, ADWO is an art and architecture practice that, as I mentioned, is based in New York City, but also by extension um, identifies between NARM, or also known as Melbourne, and Addis Ababa. The practice examines how space is imaged and valued through art, design, and curatorial interventions. Their work has been exhibited at this year's Venice Architecture Biennale, at Art Omai, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, at the Architecture Museum, at TU Munich, among other venues. They are the exhibition designers and curatorial consultants for Sightlines on Peace, Power, and Prestige, Metal Arts in Africa, an exhibition currently on view at the Bard Graduate Center in New York. Um, also an amazing project that I encourage you to all visit if you're in New York. And their multifamily housing project, Bole Rwanda, is currently under construction in Addis Ababa and is scheduled to be completed in 2024. And their work is part of the permanent collection of the High Museum of Art in Atlanta and proudly here at the Art Institute of Chicago. Dawid El Petros, <coughs> excuse me, is a visual artist and researcher and educator whose practice bridges the fields of art, design, architecture, and history, and interrogates the relationships between colonial histories and current events. He completed the Whitney Independent Study Program and holds uh, an MFA in visual art from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and Tufts University, a BFA in photography from Concordia University, and a BA in the history, a BA in history from the University of Saskatchewan. His work has been recognized with awards, including Fulbright and Terra Foundation fellowships, as well as artist residencies uh, at many institutions, including the Studio Museum in Harlem. And most re recently, he's exhibited at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, Germany, the Coast Museum for Art in Public Space in Denmark, the Ozonge Sp Spanish Biennial of African Photography, and the Huis Marseille Museum of Photography in Amsterdam. And he has an upcoming solo show, I believe, at the Museum of Contemporary Photography here in Chicago, uh, titled Prospetto Amare in 2024. And also proudly, his work is in the permanent collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. 
So with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Jen, Emmanuel, and Dawik, who will come on stage. Uh, Jen and Emmanuel will get us started with a short presentation of ADWO projects, followed by Dawit's response through the lens of his own work, and then all participants will engage in a group conversation. And we'll have time for questions from the audience at the end. So please welcome our guests. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Irene, for that wonderful um, introduction. Um, we just flew in last night, so we're still kind of adjusting uh, to Chicago. Um, but um, I think it's, it's just also important to begin by saying, you know, uh, Irene, especially, your support of our work over the past few years has been um, really meaningful, uh, and it's pushed the work in different directions. And of course, uh, Dawit. Um. We're so happy you agreed to this event, thank <laughs> you. Um, time and time again, we've turned to Dawit's work as a guide to our own practice, so we feel very lucky to be in conversation with you today, and hopefully the first of um, many others. And thank you all for coming on your Saturday afternoon to be here with us. Let's go. So one of the key ideas that drives our work is this notion of animism, a belief in the enchantment of everyday objects and sites. We are also interested in everyday spaces, uh, considering these as sites where rituals take place. And our approach to abstraction is at times a refusal of legibility playing with the edges of the visible or perhaps the knowable. Immeasurability um, is an installation that was part of a group show titled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, curated by Sean Anderson and Mabel Wilson. And our project um, for that installation considers blackness and the ordinary space of Atlanta, but also the ocean floor of the Atlantic. And this still is taken from an incredible film by uh, Mati Diop called Atlantics, which in some ways is an investigation of uh, these relational conditions that are produced uh, through time and migration. The rituals associated with uh, these ordinary spaces like Waffle House, uh, which is a popular destination after the nightclub, and how these sites uh, begin to overlap with the forest uh, in Metro Atlanta. Also the graininess uh, of the experience on the highway, just out of focus or coming into focus. And these are sites that are increasingly becoming uh, zones of congregation uh, within the city of Atlanta. We're also interested in the role that these spaces play in popular culture as sites of both refuge uh, and danger, and the forest of Atlanta as a zone for black and indigenous imagination. During our early research, we discovered this incredible painting of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, it is a planetary scar that also represents the invention of race as people were forcibly moved from Africa to the Americas. In the 1950s, Marie Tharp uh, mapped the ocean floor using sonar. Her discovery of the ridge caused a major paradigm shift uh, in Earth science, uh, leading to the acceptance of plate tectonics and continental drift theories. Along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there are these thermal vents that create towers of minerals, including gold and silver, but also this um, black magnetic sand called magnetite. And this gave our project its material logic. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge um, cannot be captured by satellite imagery. Sonar mapping is used to image its bathymetry of ridges, valleys, and cracks. And we took this as a provocation to image the planet differently as a dynamic set of forces, uh, the movement of tectonic plates, water, wind, and people. We 
We were also thinking about these dynamics at the scale of the city, where ephemeral, ephemeral spatial practices transform everyday spaces. For example, Freak, Freaknik, an annual spring break festival where students from several historically black colleges and universities gathered in Atlanta and transforming its highways and streets. This is Peter Gordon's etching of Savannah in 1734, establishing the colony of Georgia in America. Um, and we see this as a foundational diagram for the spatial practices of settler colonialism, conceptualizing the earth as something that can be measured, divided, and owned. And uh, it's important to say that we start every project with image and material studies. And our initial image studies were attempts to really work against that etching of Savannah, Georgia by um, Peter Gordon. Um, and in this case, we were really considering the slow material transformation from sand to glass as a way to think about uh, notions of instability, fixity, and fragility. We also wanted to conceptualize uh, black spatial practices not as form, but flow. And simultaneously, as we were developing those image studies, we were also developing these uh, material experiments uh, with the glass department at RISD, testing out magnetite sand uh, with combinations of cobalt and soda ash in the kiln to determine uh, the limits of cohesion, um, disintegration, density, um, and color. And our installation traces the echoes between Atlanta and the Atlantic using two disks that are six feet in diameter. The horizontal disk assembles fragments of everyday space in Atlanta, and uh, the vertical disk in the form of a tapestry overlaps the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with notations of uh, displacement and containment. And the horizontal disk, um, which is basically a landscape of 150 bricks, uh, is, uh, presents a series of fragmented scenes from these predominantly black neighborhoods in South Atlanta. And each brick is finished uh, with a layer of magnetite and magnetic black sand that Jen mentioned. And the individual bricks are of actual places in Atlanta, but they've been reconfigured in new compositions. Um, the tapestry is a timescape of weather, ground, and seabed systems. Um, this image also draws upon systems of measurement and surveillance, borrowing notations from 19th century cartography, as well as um, films like The Matrix. From a distance, the, um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the most visible aspect of the installation, but it atomizes as you move closer due to the nature of um, you know, the construction of the tapestry. Whereas the bricks on the horizontal disc initially appear as a gray haze and, and remain hazy until you get really close to the cone. Um, this is a, an overall view of the installation with the two Waffle House collages uh, occupying the corner of the gallery behind the two discs. As Irene mentioned, we were recently commissioned to design an exhibition featuring, featuring 160 metalworks from Sub-Saharan Africa at the Bard Graduate Center in New York, curated by Drew Thompson. And this is an initial assemblage that we made of all the works to kind of help get our head around the scale and the variety of the collection. There's so much uh, we really don't know about these African metalworks. So we wanted to think more broadly and expansively about the material by considering the geological constitution of the ground and how metals were introduced to the Earth's uh, crust via these meteorites uh, while Earth was still a protoplanet.
metal signified different things for different communities in Africa, um, yet it was consistently conceptualized as a bridging material between the human and spirit world. And this is really attributed to its physical transformation from below ground as ore um, into a prized material above ground via smelting practices. But our formal material and color experiments were also informed by uh, current sites of extraction on the continent, shaping and reshaping the earth and the communities that live in and around them. The exhibition is installed at the Bard Graduate Center, uh, spanning across three floors of, of a converted townhome uh, on West 86th Street. And responding to uh, the residential scale and the narrow proportion of the townhome, we designed a series of long walls that bisect the townhome sectionally across the three floors, uniting the galleries and the transitional spaces. And this is an early concept plan uh, of the second floor. And the as-built plan. The entire collection of the, um, of the works from the continent are displayed within these long walls. And the gray boxes either side denote artworks by contemporary artists, both from the continent and the diaspora. And the contemporary works can either be considered individually or as framed by the long wall with shifting associations as visitors move through the gallery. This is an, um, so sorry, the staggered platforms of the casework um, allow for smaller islands or sub-themes of grouped objects, as well as perhaps conveying kind of some sense of geological stratification. The long wall is further articulated by fins protruding out six inches um, so from the oblique, the fins render the wall opaque, um, while viewed head-on, they frame a particular sight line. And this is an isometric view of the ground floor with the contemporary works displayed either side of the long wall. And the second floor and the third floor. And this is a photograph uh, that is taken from the lobby uh, into the ground floor gallery of the exhibition. And we tried to think of each gallery um, by allocating it with its own color and theme. So this gallery is extraction. So here uh, you're looking through the wall of metalworks to a tapestry by Autobong and Kanga called Double Plot. And you can also see the reflection of Lubaina Hamid's work, uh, Drowned Orchard, collapsed into the same plane. And there are moments where you can look longitudinally down each wall. And we worked with Drew Thompson as uh, curatorial consultants in selecting the contemporary artworks, such as this piece by Lubaina Hamid, and the contemporary artworks really drove uh, both the curatorial themes uh, of the exhibition, but also the general configuration of the metalworks. And this is an image of Swing Low by Nari Ward with its shadow projected across the wainscoting of the townhome. And this is that same gallery, which is Devotion and Divination. Uh, which is anchored by three Ethiopian Orthodox uh, crosses. And this kind of shows the long wall slicing down the length of the second floor. These gold tulip bulbs are titled Semper Augustus Chicagus by Chicagoan of the Year, Amanda Williams. And this is within the currency gallery. This gallery is themed speculative architecture with Kapwani Kawanga's white gold too, made of sisal in the background and the late Redcliffe Bailey's works in the reflection. Here is protection with Sede Makunin's luminous light towers standing by and reflecting around this uh, feline scepter. 
And as the long wall becomes opaque, your eye is drawn to Bronwyn Katz's work on the left, made of bed springs, and Abigail Lucien's piece echoing the, balust uh, the balustrade of the stair. This is another work by Abigail Lucien in the stairwell. Uh, the final gallery is um, Embodying Power, anchored by these fleshy binoculars by Julia Phillips. Observing through and uh, yeah, through the long wall towards the tapestry by Zora Opoku. The fourth floor features a film by Sami Baloji connecting the colonial past and present of the Democratic Republic of Congo. All land in Ethiopia is owned by the state. People who fail to build up and densify their plots risk expropriation. In other words, state ownership of land is not used as uh, originally intended to address the growing wealth inequality, but instead to intensify real estate speculation. The city of Addis Ababa has functioned as a continuous construction site for the past 20 years. This image of blue tarp tethered to eucalyptus scaffolding is the most ubiquitous envelope found throughout the city. Eucalyptus was imported from Australia to Ethiopia in the late 19th century. This fast growing species fulfilled the building and firewood needs of the early years of the new capital. Since then, this species has caused severe ecological impacts, such as depleting water and intensifying erosion. But it's also important to note that the Amharic word Gibi itself um, is a word that's used uh, to uh, connote a territory surrounded by a fence. And a variety of um, materials uh, are used to fence in the plots. Eucalyptus trunks, corrugated sheets, metal grills, stone, and masonry. So slight shifts in the enunciation of the word Gibi Gabi, Gibi, provide different meanings. It could suggest a welcoming invitation or a threatening infiltration. We were invited to participate in the Venice Architecture Biennial curated by Leslie Loco titled The Laboratory of the Future. Our installation considers the Gibbies of Addis Ababa as zones of respite carved out of an errant and restless city. We happened to be in Addis when we started working on this project, so uh, we immediately went around and started documenting the various gibbies of the city. This picture is taken at dusk of one of the largest church gibbies in Addis, uh, where figures slip in and out of a forested area surrounding the church building. So most people attend the service from the garden rather than within the building itself. We collaborated um, also with a photographer based in the city, Zion Haile Selassie, uh, to document the ordinary and ritualistic conditions within and around the Gebi. For Venice, we produced two large tapestries, uh, each 20 feet by 10 feet. Uh, and the aim was to illustrate the ambiguities and contradictions embedded in the material and immaterial significance um, of the Gebi typology. We worked with Textile Lab in Tilburg in the Netherlands, uh, first remotely for a few months, and then we had an intensive workshop. Uh, there were thousands of yarn types to choose from, each with their own properties that needed to be calibrated with the mechanical loom. Um, and the available weave patterns kind of gave us further control over the three-dimensionality of the tapestry structure. Our installation um, was positioned in an archway between two thematic zones of the Arsenale, simulating the lush interiors of the Gebi. The blue tarp and scaffolding operate at the scale of the Arsenale building itself, this medieval hall, 
while the two tapestries frame a more intimate yet transitional moment for people moving through the exhibition. The tapestries were hung behind these corrugated panels, uh, so they were initially shielded from view. And we had uh, 10 images of Gibbies suspended within the scaffolding, offering portals to Addis through the blue tarp. As you turn the corner, fragments of the two tapestries are revealed. This tapestry combines an image of the blue tarp with a composition from a canonical painting by Bellaccio Ymer depicting the Battle of Ottawa. We're also thinking about uh, the work of acclaimed Ethiopian painter, Skunder Bogosian, who mythologized the prayer beads used by monks in the highlands of Ethiopia as ways to think about spirituality and exile. The second tapestry describes the moment of simultaneously being within and outside the Gebi, um, not as a retreat from the world, but a site perhaps where a world is cultivated. It is a stage for the re-enchantment of everyday spaces and rituals in Addis, which you could argue as a Gibi within a Gibi, bounded by and temporally detached from regimes of property. So back to Chicago. This past summer, we collaborated with the Buell Center at Columbia University to produce an installation for the Chicago Architectural Architecture Biennial titled, This is a Rehearsal, curated by the Floating Museum. 100 Links builds on the research that the Buell Center has been organizing around land, as well as our own research we've been developing around questions of measurement and valuation. Gunter's chains and corner mounds are devices that measured and marked vast territories during the colonization of North America. The mounds were dug out from four pits to show where the grid intersected and where, where plots could be bought. Uh, this is the Gunter's chain um, and each is tagged and divided into 100 links. Uh, and this was the, the apparatus used to measure these plots. So our installation basically melds uh, Gunther's chain and the corner mount. So we suspended the mount so that visitors could walk around, under, and through it, conveying how we are embedded within the land. And Gunther's chains are 66 feet long, and they are comprised of rings and rods. So the unit length is approximately eight inches from the center line of one ring to the next. And we collaborated with Paul Russell, who's a blacksmith here in Chicago, to make thousands of these uh, chain elements by hand. And this is a diagrammatic plan of the installation. Uh, the chain strands make a voided kind of pyramidal mount. And an elevation uh, suspended from the ceiling. This shows how these systems of measurement appear in their idealized form. and how they begin to deform as they move from the realm of abstraction to materialization. We work through many digital and physical models to analyze how tensioning um, at the corners could impact the overall form. There were lots of conversations around calibrating the sag. And this is the preliminary paperclip model, which ended up being um, a remarkably accurate simulation of what the final installation ended up being. Of course, we produced renderings to, to help us understand the scale of this work within uh, the Chicago rooms. And as Emmanuel mentioned, the, the mound is suspended in the four pits. Uh, underneath each side of the mound um, contain copies of the Buell's, uh, the Buell Center's publication, and these are available for the taking. We are in the central Chicago room um, across the street from here. So the city and park are on your right and the courtyard is on the left. 
The anthropomorphic tags of Gunter's chain denote every 10 links or eight feet, uh, making a combination of decimal and English systems. Uh, from left to right, the tags indicate 10 or 90 links, 20 or 80, uh, 30 or 70, 40 or 60, and 50. Um, the array of tags in the gallery is um, a superimposition of several curves from the sagging chain uh, projected and aligned to the same datum within the gallery. And creating a misalignment with the eight inch unit of the chain structure. So depending on your sight line, the tags are simultaneously liberated from and contained by the chain. We're also thinking about ongoing dynamics of enclosure and dispossession and the relationship between these systems of measurement and the human body. Thank you, David. I think we can proceed to the next slide, please. So I made this photograph of two young women carrying a barele in the neighborhood of Aratkilo. And the barele is a ubiquitous tool of labor and exchange found on construction sites in Addis Ababa. I was interested in the conditions of its use, which require cooperation, unified movement, and commitment to a shared set of social obligations. The term itself, barelle, derives from the Italian word for stretcher, which alerts us to the largely forgotten Italian empire in the Horn of Africa. So this simple form articulates complex stories of labor, movement, and their relationship to the spatial logics of colonialism. And it's in, this type of in, it's in this type of impulse, harnessing a material and cultural technology from East Africa, interrogating it across multiple configurations, experimenting with it, and then assessing its power and social force, that I recognize a deep kinship with the brilliant work of Jen Wood and Emmanuel Admasu. So the research and production I've been doing since 2011 seeks to complicate understandings of movement across Africa, but more specifically, the movement of African bodies across the Mediterranean Sea by connecting vectors of transnational mobilities. So in the image on the left, we see the hand of a young Eritrean framing a historical photograph showing an Italian family reaching an agricultural settlement in Libya in 1927. And on the right, a page from Revista Coloniale, a historical publication, with the words spacio disponibile, meaning available space. So while referring to the opportunity to advertise, it tacitly invokes colonial desires of ownership, extraction, access to the colony, and its inhabitants. So the pairing, the strategy of pairing these photographs is intended to create both a separation and a dialogue of movement between Africa, Europe, and North America in the past and in the present. Which brings us to prospetto mare, which means roughly prospectus to sea, as in the uh, body of water which brings Chicago into these conversations. And specifically, I'm interested in how Chicago's built environment intersects with the colonial project which occupied East Africa. So this is a history that has been sanitized, but is found in rem remembrances to fascist General Italo Balbo, who led a transatlantic squadron of 25 seaplanes that landed on Lake Michigan for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933. And so you see on the left, Balboa Avenue in downtown Chicago, and on the right, Balbo, uh, a monument to Italo Balbo in Burnham Park. So the narrative of aviation as a technology of progress is anchored on the representational contrast with East Africans and East African landscapes. 
And it's through this contrast that the event of Balboa's flight has a barbaric result in the invasion of Ethiopia, of one, one of the places in, in 1935, when, Ethiopian, when Italian pilots flew in similar formations, but this time spraying mustard gas over fields, watercourses, and villages. Unseen topographies are 3D prints sitting on black plinths, which depict two of these locations. On the left, Mekale, and on the right, Adwa. And you see these hollowed out forms on the surface, which represent the mechanics tools that were used to repair the Savoia Marchetta, the engines which powered the military planes. So unseen topographies then considers how mechanisms in the service of aerial war and the mapping processes that established boundaries of colonial entities transgressed by those mechanisms are manifestations of colonial knowledge and power. And these effects have produced deep incisions in the landscape on the, connect, on the continent, and these are deeply connected to current hostilities that, uh, that, that are unfolding in the region. And the last image that I will, um, the last image that I will share, is of a visitor examining a multi-panel work called Spectre, Teleferica, and you see the detail in the image on the left. Teleferica imagine, reimagines a massive infrastructure that once moved goods from the Red Sea port of Massawa to the capital city of Asmara. So the networked colonial landscape is emblematized through a set of inverted images that are then etched on the back of this black plexiglass. So what you end up seeing is the image in reverse. And so the language of this work is ambiguous. The experience is productively frustrating. And it's a, it, right, the, the result is an encounter that denies easy acts of visual consumption to bring visitors into a dialogue with their own acts of looking and with a set of positionalities in histories and cartographies of East Africa. And this is where I would like to begin our conversation in this shared commitment to practices that prioritize complexity, ambiguity, and, uh, and reciprocity. So I'm really interested in, I've, and I had an, an amazing opportunity to go and visit 100 Links. And if you don't mind, this is where I would like to begin. Um, you know, this piece that is my first initial inclination as soon as I was under this mound was, it reminded me of being under my mother's uh, traditional hut, the Agdo, the form. But then I began to sort of think about the, the implications of the mound with, with a radically different uh, resonance. And so I'm curious, in the evolution of that piece, its relationship to this thematic for you of this is a rehearsal, you know, this amazing, I think this beautiful uh, theme of the exhibition, of the, uh, of, of the biennial, how the piece evolved in relationship to that theme, how you understand that theme, and how they developed a uh, certain reciprocity within each other. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's a, it's a tough question um, because it's also for us, first of all, I'll say the, the whole theme, this, this is a rehearsal. What was exciting about it to us is that the curators were trying to redirect the resources of the biennial and um, potentially redirect it towards projects that have long-term long, long -term impacts on the city. And um, for us, did I do that? Um, so for, for us, it's, uh, it, was, it was an opportunity to really think about these colonial tools very carefully and to see if there's an opportunity to redirect what they mean and what they have meant, uh, especially to this continent. And it's hard to find beauty um, in these contexts, but it's, it's important to really meditate on these tools and to try to see how they can basically pick up on different vibrance and different, uh, sorry, different vibrations that might be uh, developing at this present moment, you know, especially when it comes to measuring and uh, dividing land. 
Yeah, it's also been just to sort of touch upon your first reaction versus what the, the piece is about. It's been interesting um, kind of watching people enter the gallery not knowing what it's about and they kind of react to the piece in a certain way and then they read about it and the sort of look on their face changes. Like it's kind of, it, it changes from something of like, oh, wow, this is kind of like whimsical spider web, like there's like a, a, a whimsy to it almost. And then when they learn about it, it's like it's, it's, it's kind of, it turns into a horror story and, and kind of watching people's relationship um, and like language, their body language change towards the work has been pretty interesting for us. Yeah, I think when we were hanging out uh, right after installing in the, uh, on the opening day, the first person that walked over and spoke to us said she walked inside and she felt like she thought it was really peaceful to be in it. She felt at peace. And then the next person that, that walked over and spoke to us said, you know, she was terrified as soon as she walked <laughs> into the room. So I think from the beginning we were trying to understand you know this liminal space between maybe what would be considered the sublime versus you know the horror of these tools and what they begin to unleash you used a word that i struggle with which was beauty and if i could just very quickly pick up on that because i think part of my attraction to you know to your work is the command of visual language, the way, you know, the capacity with which you have to refine it, to really, really work with materials in ways that I find incredibly, incredibly seductive and powerful to the eye. But at the same time, they're invoking these deeply, deeply problematic and horrendous sort of histories. And so I would love to hear, this is something that I've yet to resolve for me, but I would love to hear how you operate in that space between beauty and, uh, and something that is radical, that manifests something so, uh, so destructive. I think we are very, um, we try to read through all of these things in a way, like for example, for the tapestries for Metropolitan at MoMA, we uh, use maps that were made by you know, Confederate cartographers, like, you know, that, that, that's, that's pretty intense, but like they're beautiful maps. And so like we're taking, and so we're taking notations from Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a difficult thing, but I think when we go into the visual realm, we want some somehow we want an easy correlation between, you know, these brutal uh, regimes and uh, the objects they produce, and identifying br brutality within the object and the built form is actually much much more difficult. So I think for the most part, it's become a practice of trying to find images that we can respond to, and then doing the work of excavating what, or trying to understand what those images have done, you know? And that, that discovery always leads us to draw the image differently or to spatialize it differently. I mean, these, these maps that Jen is referring to, you know, from the beginning when we found that painting of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we were like, okay, this is the best way to begin to think about you know, the African continent and the Americas relationally, you know? And also it's an opportunity to really find an image, I mean, an image at the scale of the planet that in some ways represents, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. And at the same time, we were also discovering these wind maps, um, you know, 19th century wind maps that are super detailed, super accurate, that were used by slave ships. So how do you begin to juxtapose these things and use them as ways to think about, you know, the, the everyday lives of people in Atlanta today. And, and I think those, those conceptual um, relations are what, what have been extremely generative for our practice. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would love to also, you know, it, it, because I've been thinking about this since, you know, since our first meeting, you know, is the, the positionality, I think that you you know, the positionality that you occupy between, you know, Melbourne, Australia, Addis Ababa, as well as, uh, you know, as, well as uh, uh, New York City. I'm really interested in the way in which I think that position complicates some of the thematics that you're, that you're working within. So to look at the project of immeasurability that looks at, right, is, um, that looks at, if you could bring that up, that would be great. The immeasurability looks at the, um, 
No, um, am I confusing it with Atlanta? No, that is, uh, right. So the way in which you're operating in this African-American space, connected to histories of the, uh, right, connected to histories of the black Atlantic, but they are then circulating through experiences, through, you know, through all of the incredible amount of time and cultural references that you're extracting and, and working with in terms, of, you know, in terms of Ethiopia. And specifically the piece that I want to talk about are the eucalyptus. Because I think part of what that work is doing, which is of real interest to me, is it's talking about a form of indigeneity. I mean, we don't, I don't think that African indigeneity is, is, right, is, is commonly uh, um, sort of at the forefront of people's thinking. And so here we have this eucalyptus from Australia that makes its way into Ethiopia. And it now begins to introduce this conversation of a form of blackness that is outside of that paradigm of right, African-American, um, the Black Atlantic. So I'm really curious how you are, how you're navigating that kind of an expansive, I think really complicated um, way of, black, of sort of thinking about blackness, working with, with, with diverse black uh, material and cultural traditions. <laughs> that was a lot of questions, wasn't it? <laughs> that, was, that was a few questions. So I'll try to answer eucalyptus. I mean, you know, I don't know if there are any Ethiopians in the crowd, but, um, you know, for me, as, as someone who grew up in Ethiopia, it's important to acknowledge that Ethiopia was an empire. So, and it's an empire that operated aspirationally. So Emperor Menelik, when he was trying to modernize, you know, after basically absorbing the region in the south, was referring to other empires, you know, and the, the emperors before him were also referring to other empires. So he was already in conversation to bring species that would speed up this project to modernization, you know. But that also means that the, the, those power asymmetries, you know, will, get, will continue to persist, which means when you bring eucalyptus into Addis to speed up the construction of the new city and the need for firewood, it also decimated all of the indigenous trees in the region. So um, I always think, I mean, we have to think about, we have to accept the fact that these ideas travel, but we have to really look carefully at the ways in which they land at different parts of the world. So I think the way eucalyptus landed in Ethiopia is something that the nation is still dealing with ecologically. Uh, but also a lot of those aspirations of becoming an empire in that region are the things that are causing a lot of the conflicts that we're dealing with today. So um, we're, a lot of our work is, we, we often say it's a timescape because I don't think you can tell the story through some sort of linear narrative, but there are a series of cyclical events that basically recall or revert back to certain kind of reflexes that reproduce the violence of the past. And sometimes the violence is imposed on the landscape and the ecology, and sometimes it's imposed on specific communities. But the, the eucalyptus story is, I think, something that we're still trying to unpack, also because of the fact that it is the scaffolding for all of the new buildings that are being built throughout the city. Um, yeah, I think we really kind of frame it as a protagonist of this like animist materialist agenda that we have in our practice. Um, I think also just the personal connection. I'm from Australia, so I and you know you know and eucalyptus there is mythologized in a certain way, um, in a myriad of ways. And so I think we're just fascinated by that exchange um, across the ocean. How this species now there's 55 eucalyptus species in Ethiopia, and how that's landed. And yeah, it, it really was part of the formation of the nat nation state. Like Addis Ababa means new flower, and it's speculated even that that comes from the eucalyptus flower. So I feel like there's, there's so many narratives in there that we want to understand further and, and build upon. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm compelled by that because part of what, you know, the 2014-15 um, when I was doing a significant amount of movement through the continent, part of what I had to, uh, to confront was my own limited understanding of how I understood diaspora or African diaspora, something that operates outside of the continent and sort of thinking about my own practices perpetuating a very limited uh, understanding when in fact the majority of African mobilities and diasporas circulate within the continent. 
right? And so when we begin to think about those kinds of, of, uh, of realities, it radically complicates the way, right, the dissatisfaction, I think, of, that, uh, that, compel, that gives certain narratives a certain amount of, uh, a certain amount of power. Were you looking at Miguel? Miguel. Okay. Um, so I think we could sit and talk all day, but I think the idea is there are going to be some microphones uh, being passed around. So at a certain moment, it would be wonderful for, you know, for, you know, for, for those of you who, who have questions to stand up and, uh, and pose the questions to us. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Very uh, enlightening to hear these ideas. And my question is about the use of tapestries. Um, I found it to be interesting in terms of like the resolution of how the tapestries can depict different types of mapping or research. Um, but even in 100 Links, the recent project, seeing the kind of like woven nature of the links. Um, so I wonder if you could speak more to your interest in tapestry and weaving as a medium. Um, that's a really great question. I feel like where I think our practice in some ways is about, um, hang on, let me backtrack a little bit. I feel like um, researching Dawit's work for us has given us a language to think about our own. So through the Black Athena Collective, there's this series titled um, Archaeology of the Image. And so I think we're, we're very much interested in like, what is the, um, the construct, like the, the physical literal construction of the image. So tapestries, we're fascinated by like the inbuilt like resolution, the kind of like the way that threads each have their own kind of like material properties that behave differently. Um, the fact that it, there's a limited resolution as well. I feel like architects, you know, renderings and drawings, especially at architecture school, it's about kind of like, you know, how much resolution can we gain in there, but like to what, to what effect? Um, and then I think it is connected, that interest with 100 links in that it, it's somewhere between a drawing and an installation. We, I think we do kind of see it as more of a suspended drawing. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if you want to add to that one. I'll just add one thing, which I think, you know, we, the first tapestry we did was, um, a tapestry in response to the work we were doing around urban marketplaces in East Africa. And there's just this dissatisfaction with the images that we were producing. They didn't contain the richness of the spaces or the richness of the ideas that we were trying to explore. And tapestry basically gave us this additional uh, layer of complexity. So even after we, we are done with the image digitally or uh, after we've produced the image, we basically begin a conversation with the fabricators of the tapestry that moves it in very different directions. So I think it, ex it extends the period of iteration and it allows us to engage with other forms of legibility that you can achieve with a printed image. While we wait for a question, I'm going to I'm going to just very quickly. It's I just it, it, you know in hearing you speak in Tigrinya, Gabi it refers to a shawl, yeah. right? So it just Gabi's Gabi. Okay, okay. So it's interested in that etymology and whether or not there is any uh, sort of proximity to them, uh, both in terms of how they act. One acts as a right as a as a covering for the uh, for the body, and the other acts as a as a covering for the perimeter of the house, right? And if we have no other questions, we can uh, go ahead and uh, wrap up the program. Uh, I think we have one over there. We have one uh, right here as well. So we'll just can do these two. That's OK. Just don't want you to go it away too easy. Uh, although I don't really have a question, but maybe a kind of extension of um, the reflection about uh, eucalyptus, um, which is, uh, 
like San Francisco Bay, uh, that eucalyptus is prevalent there. My understanding is because, uh, I guess it's it grows a spiral grain, so it's tough to cut. Um, and so in a way it became something that defines the area, but it's not, um, it's not about so much the uh, using it for scaffolding, or I think the intent was to have a wood that you could harvest quite rapidly, uh, but it actually has a different effect. But in some ways, I think maybe just expanding on the idea that um, uh, looking at eucalyptus, which changes kind of narratives and changes kind of oceans, because right? I guess it would be both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, rather than thinking exclusively about the Atlantic, so it's not, I can't say, any, it's not a question, just a kind of extension of that idea um, of maybe thinking about things differently. Yeah, I feel like we could talk about trees and the and identity um, for most of the day. I feel like in, in the tapestry, one of the tapestries, the green one for Venice, there's a the peppercorn branch on the left and um, like peppercorn trees were imported to Australia from South America as, and the, you see them in zoos and post offices and like schools. So there was kind of a, a, a set of like introduced species to like design what this like country, um, you know, newly settled country should look like. And it's also considered an avenue tree in Adi. So again, it's sort of like brought there to sort of like, I don't know, convey some sort of stateliness. Um, so yeah, we're, we're sort of like very, we, we love the sort of like how these trees are instrumentalized. I mean, interestingly, Brazil is now the largest producer of e eucalyptus in the world. So there's kind of this strange exchange going on, but. Sorry, I just kind of wandered off there, but. Hi, uh, oh, hello, hi. Um, I just, first of all, wanted to thank you for the talk. It was incredibly informative to see all of your work. I was really interested in how you negotiate um, when you're speaking about such broad uh, differing spaces throughout the world and then when you get the opportunity to show here or show in New York or show in Venice, um, how does your like relationship to the work you're making change based off of where you are getting to exhibit the work? It's, it's a tough question. I mean, um, you know, I, I think we try as much as possible to identify a set of questions that we are testing in different contexts. So, um, you know, the question is somewhat similar if you think about 100 links versus the installation that we did in Venice. But just because of the fact that 100 links had to deal with North America, um, it produced a very different kind of installation versus the Venice work, the context of it and the way the whole exhibition was framed by Leslie Loco required us to think about the spaces differently. And it also required us to think about ways of establishing new portals between Italy and Ethiopia. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think some of these are undercurrents, you know, but... Um, at least to us, I would say, 100 links is very different from the Venice installation. But some friends of ours who know our work well would say they're actually very similar. Um, yeah, I don't know any other way to answer that outside of, I, I hope we have some clear obsessions. Um, and I hope those obsessions uh, produce different results in different contexts. Um, thank you so much, Jen, Emmanuel, and Dawit. Um, it's been such a pleasure to listen to you speak about your projects together. And also, um, for those of you that couldn't tell, um, Jen and Emmanuel had not met Dawit before, but it's been really wonderful to see <laughs> the connections and the friendships that have really formed in the 
process of organizing this event. Um, so we're really glad to have all three of you in conversation uh, with all of us today. So thank you again, and thank you all for joining us here at the museum. Thank you.